As always, I'm thankful to have the opportunity to speak to you on this Lord's Day. This morning, in the next few moments, I would like for us to study on a very basic level the idea of fellowship. Fellowship. When we see this term used in our New Testament, we see that this English word fellowship comes from a couple words, one of which being the Greek word koinonia, which means to share which one has in anything, to share in a common interest, or to have communion. And another word that is often rendered as fellowship or similar terms is metoche, which means a partnership, a holding with, a sharing in, or a partaking of. Putting all these different ideas together, fellowship can be described as a state of being together, a companionship of those who have similar interests, a feeling or an activity. It would describe a community of those who are closely connected by a common goal or a similar purpose, or a partnership in which all participate equally in a given undertaking. I think the word fellowship kind of gives us a clue to that because it deals with fellows on a ship. When you, you think about the ships of old where they had all the rigging, the sails to tend to, you had certainly one leader, but all the people on that boat had a common goal, and that is to, one, stay afloat, and two, meet their goal, which would be whatever the captain's wishes were. I also think of the dreadnoughts, uh, particularly, you know, the battleship Texas. During World War II, it participated in the landing of Normandy, but it did something I would say quite abnormal because the people on that boat recognized certain limitations in its uh, gun systems. So they flooded some of their tanks, their air tanks, and tilted the ship to one side. This provided them longer reach in their artillery shells. So they were able to pound the ground area for our troops, the Allied forces, to make it further into the country. I think that's rather interesting. But you had people on this ship with a common goal of let's destroy the Axis powers. One of those things was the landing at Normandy. And so they provided that sort of assistance to our Allied soldiers. When we think of fellowship in a New Testament sense, it's similar to that in that we should have a common goal, and that is heaven. But in a secular sense, we see fellowship all around us. This generic term, because fellowship is a generic term, it can be enjoyed by the likes of golfers, soldiers, firefighters, I remember in high school, we had the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. I wasn't a part of it, but they would always announce over the school speaker, we're going to have a donut on Thursday together, and they'd talk about who knows what. So it was a fellowship, a bunch of kids that don't really know what fellowship is, and generally speaking, don't know what Christians are. But nonetheless, that was the title of this organization. So fellowship continue, would continue even on to devil worshipers. They have fellowship. Now, that's not the kind of fellowship we're concerned with. What we want to be concerned about is having fellowship with our Creator, Jehovah God. New Testament fellowship begins with God. Each person of the Godhead has all things in common. They have a sharing. They have a purpose. Now, they have orchestrated the scheme of redemption so that this blessing of fellowship can be extended and has been extended to all of mankind. And if it would help to visualize 
the idea of fellowship, think of a hub and a wheel, particularly a bicycle, where you have God as the hub in the center, and each line, each spoke, is that relationship of fellowship. And then you have on the outer side, the rim, that would be man. Well, that spoke connects the hub to the rim. So you have fellowship between God and man. And then as that rim continues in that circle, you have fellowship between men. Now, man must seek to have this type of relationship with God. And it should be first and foremost in each of our lives. And then we must also seek to have godly scriptural fellowship with other people who have fellowship with God. Now, I said this was going to be a basic study. Now, fundamentally, one is either in fellowship with God or they are out of fellowship with God. Now, a part of that, there are four categories of this idea of fellowship. Four classifications which I would like for us to consider this morning. First and foremost, category one, are the newborns. Are newborns in fellowship with God? There is a doctrine, total hereditary depravity. And this claims that each person, each baby, inherits complete corruption and wickedness from their parents. Just as they would inherit eye color, hair color, and any other physical genetic trait we possess. And this would go all the way back to Adam and Eve, or they would call the original sin. Thus, all of mankind then, according to this doctrine, is born in sin and in, incapable of performing any good deed in and of themselves. Every child then, has, who has ever been born, carries with it the sins of their parents. And you think of how many generations have existed before you, so that would really be a compounding sinner there. But as always, we must ask, what does the Bible say about such matters? Well, in Acts chapter 17, verses 27 through 29, says there that they, should, they that should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own prophets have said, for we are his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. We know from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 9, that God fathered our spirits. And he gave us our spirit, our immortal spirit, which we typically refer to as a soul. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. Question then, does God create a depraved spirit? Does the weakness of our flesh override the power of God and His ability? There was a couple months ago when I was up here trying to cut the grass where we had a homeless person and he, we had a, a very long conversation and this subject came up. If you've, if you've met him, his name is Scott. I haven't seen him in a while. But we had a very good discussion and he switches over to this concept of total depravity. And I asked him these questions. And I'm still waiting on his answer. Um, I referenced these scriptures, and I referenced the ones that we're about to read, and he got mad, he packed his stuff up, and he walked away. Because he was making a claim that is not found in the Bible. And I told him, I said, if you're making such a claim, that means you do not know your Bible as well as you think you do. And it's at that point where he folded his things up and walked away. But people like him and anybody that wants to hold to the doctrine of total depravity like this needs to really begin in Genesis. 
chapter 1, verse 26. Our spirit is made in God's image. Now, according to Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 18 through 20, it there plainly says that a child does not inherit the sins of their parents. That passage reads as follows. As for his father, because he cruelly oppressed, spoiled his brother by violence, and did that which is not good among his people, lo, even he shall die in his iniquity. Yet say ye, why? Doth not the son bear the iniquity of the father? When the son hath done that which is lawful and right, and hath kept all my statutes, and hath done them, he shall surely live. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. The individual is responsible for their individual acts, their thoughts, their words. For what he or she does. The child does not bear responsibility for the actions the parents engage in. Nor do parents bear the sins of what the children commit. Furthermore, we find in Matthew chapter 18 verses 1 through 4. A curious statement made by our Savior. Curious in light of this doctrine of total depravity. Describing those who would be entering into his church, the kingdom of God. That passage reads, At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of God, excuse me, kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted, and become as little demons, I mean children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever, therefore, shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Here our Savior says that one must become a little child, become like a child in order to enter the kingdom of God. If we're born depraved, why would Jesus use a depraved little demonic baby this child as a fine upstanding example of what it means to be a Christian this is completely illogical this only makes sense though the statement that our Lord made only makes sense if children babies are born innocent and pure we find in Romans chapter 3 verse 12 that all have gone out of the way, have become unprofitable. In order for these things to be true, one must have been in possession of the state of being profitable as well as in the way. You cannot leave what you were never a part of. This lends itself to one word which I would say destroys this doctrine. And that is reconciliation. New Testament restoration of divine favor. When you look at tractors, I like tractors. I have a little bit of a background in agriculture. And you, you go out and buy an old tractor, say an old 8 in, And it looks like a hunk of junk. And it may even be a hunk of junk. But to some... Well, that's just a diamond in the rough. And they devote their time, and they paint it, they, they sand everything down, they put Chevy parts on it, and they paint it orange. Is that a restoration? No, that's a reformation. You see, a purist, as they're often called, would take that old Ford 8 in tractor, and put all Ford parts on it and restore it to factory beauty. Reconciliation does that with each and every one of us. 
if we were never with God in the beginning, rest, reconciliation would make no sense. We'll study more about this in a little bit as we go on. But this stage that we've just been discussing, what stage of life does this cover? Well, it covers the day of one's birth all the way through, or up until, rather, the age of accountability. That's not a specific number. That's a point in every person's life when they're able to distinguish between right and wrong, and then they choose to do right or wrong. Oftentimes, we choose to do what is wrong. But this period of life, from baby to the age of accountability, one is in fellowship with God, and this person is considered spiritually safe, S-A-F-E, safe. Our second category deals with those who are out of fellowship with God. And these are the folks that have passed from this first stage of life and are now accountable and through their own choices have decided to commit sin. As we said, life begins sinless, but then we choose to go out of the way. Romans 3.12 once more. Through one's sinful choices, one becomes unprofitable. Sinful choices lead to sinful behavior. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That three-letter word, all, leaves no one out. Couple that with Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Sin brings death in every case. This refers to a spiritual separation from our Creator. But what is sin? Sin is, is the result of unlawful or unrighteous actions on the part of one who has the, the ability to discern between right and wrong. It is a voluntary departure from a divine law in any way. 1 John 3, 4 puts it this way. And this comes from the American Standard Version. Everyone that doeth sin doeth also lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. I think the King James Version refers to it as transgression, or transgressing the law. So transgression or, law, or lawlessness occurs when one is tempted and then succumbs to that temptation. James chapter 1, verses 13, 14, and 15, which says, Let no man say when he is tempted, solicited to sin, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, Neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. This is how everyone sins. The, son, the same process occurs with each and every one of us. Sin is enticing, so we decide to chase after it. And then when practiced enough, it becomes a part of our lifestyle. This lifestyle can be plainly seen in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 23, where these people engage in all sorts of unrighteousness or unrighteous behavior, disgusting to every extent of the imagination. These people here discussed in this passage, we note, had sufficient evidence for God's existence. And this would apply for all of mankind. But upon that evidence, they were expected then to obey God, to seek for Him, to search out, to learn what His will is for us. However, they chose not to. Instead, they chose to be filled with all unrighteousness. Now this, as we said, this passage lists very, various sinful acts and behaviors. And they practiced them to the extent that they became part of their lives. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 2 through 3, kind of expand on this idea. Paul there penned, Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we, had, we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, 
fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. You see, when you practice sin long enough, it becomes what we consider second nature. It becomes a matter of instinct. It's your normal way of doing things. It becomes our standard operating procedure. We know from Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2, though, that it is these sins that keep us separated from our God. Thus, someone in this predicament is out of fellowship with God and thus lost. Our third category is the next stage of development, if you will, and that is the person who is in fellowship with God because they have become a Christian. This is a person who has decided to obey the gospel of Christ. This person has heard the gospel, Romans 10, 17. They have decided to develop a belief in Christ as the Son of God, John 8, 24. They have decided to repent of their past sins, Acts 3, 19. They have also decided to publicly confess their faith in Christ as the Son of God, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. And finally, they have made the decision to be immersed in water, to contact the blood of Christ in the act of baptism, to gain the remission of sins, Acts chapter 22, verse 16. As a result, this person now is a new creature. He or she has then crucified their old manner of life, that old conversation, their old way of doing things. Galatians chapter 5, verse 24, and Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, which reads as follows. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. So you see the relationship between the individual and the world versus the individual with God. If one is to be in fellowship with God, one must be dead to the world and the world dead to him. This old way of living has been put to death and was buried in the act of baptism. We see this from Romans chapter 6 verse 4, Colossians chapter 2 verse 12, and we see at this point that their new life begins, Romans chapter 6 verses 1 through 14. Now this life requires one being a servant of the living God. Romans chapter 6, verses 15 through 22. In this walk, the Christian has access to something that others do not. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. So we have fellowship with other Christians. We have fellowship with God. Now that Christian is expected to abstain from evil, to do good works, to bear fruit, to edify the brethren, to be edified by the brethren, to read and study their Bibles, to grow in the knowledge that they, they now possess, and then to be able to teach this same gospel to those around them, to the lost. As a Christian, one is a child of God once again. Our past sins were forgiven, the slate has been wiped clean, as it were. He or she has been reconciled to God. You see, that which separated the two has been removed, and that is sin. When we were in the lost condition, we were enemies to God due to sin. Christ made it possible for them to be taken away. When we obey the gospel, the favor of God has been restored to us. Romans chapter 5, verses 10 and 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 16. And Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 through 23. Again, it is impossible to be reconciled to God if we were never with Him to begin with. You think of it as a child when you're going out to some event we were at the zoo last week, and we were walking through. We had just finished 
go into one of the exhibits and I heard a, a child screaming as if looking for their parents. And eventually the kid stopped screaming, found his parents. Those three were reconciled. The kid no doubt had wandered away. Maybe they saw a goat they wanted to go pet. Mom and daddy didn't realize it. Child walked away. Well, when that child started screaming, mom and daddy heard their cry. They were reconciled. They were brought back together. We are often that child. We run away from our father. We go after sin. And sometimes we wake up, we regain our senses, we do what is right to take the corrective action, and we're reconciled to God. That begins by following God's plan for salvation as we typically coin it. Now we must point out that it is still possible for a Christian to sin and thus lose their salvation. We see in Acts chapter 8 verses 18 through 24 where our brother Simon the former sorcerer, sorcerer committed a sin unto death. Or not unto death, excuse me. 1 John chapter 5 verses 16 and 17. We see from this passage that due to his tender heart and his quick repentance that he remained in fellowship with God. Again, hearkening back to 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You see, Simon made full benefit of the blood of Christ. He had become a Christian. He was converted. But he stumbled. And he quickly repented. And he prayed for forgiveness. This is typically referred to as the second law of pardon. All Christians are able to appeal to it. By living a life of faithful service to God, it allows us to maintain fellowship with God. This person who has restored fellowship with God is considered saved. Now for our fourth and final category. <clears throat> this individual is out of fellowship with God, and this describes an erring brother. This person was once baptized for the mission of sins, and perhaps they even lived very well as a Christian. They could have been a fine, upstanding example of what a Christian should be. Yet, through the process we described earlier, they succumbed to temptation. They sinned, and unfortunately refused to repent of that sin. At this point, they have decided to err from the faith. And they have even given up the faith. This is warned against in Galatians chapter 5 verse 4. This person is seen in Luke chapter 15 verses 11 through 13. We typically refer to this as the prodigal son. And this is a stage of his development. Verse 11 reads, and he said, A certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. You see, he chose to be unfaithful, and he chose to live or engage in riotous living. The sins which he committed went unrepented of. This is, is what is referred to as, as a sin unto death. Again, 1 John 5, verse 16. This describes every sin that goes unrepented of. This type or this pattern for this type of person is also seen in Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 17. It reads, Moreover, if thy, brother, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between him and thee alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. 
But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. We see in this passage that a sin has occurred between two brethren. The offended party attempts to restore this relationship between the offensive party. Unfortunately, the attempt is ignored. Then witnesses must be taken to establish this matter. Even that attempt went ignored. The matter then is to be brought before the, the entire congregation. Unfortunately, still ignored. Fellowship then is publicly withdrawn from this individual. And the resulting in an erring brother or sister who has had their fellowship with that congregation removed. Now before this transpired, they were losing fellowship with God. And at this point, it's, if you will, for lack of better terminology, has been made official. It's a sad time, but it must occur. When withdrawal of fellowship must occur, the scriptural sense, the whole congregation is expected to participate in that they honor this withdrawal, this removal. This erring member of the church has been delivered to Satan. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. They are to be marked as disorderly. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 11. Now the purpose of withdrawing this fellowship, one, it keeps the church pure. Have you ever had a, a bushel of apples and one of them goes ruined? If you keep them all together, it won't be very long until that entire bushel of apples also ruins, becomes moldy. You can't eat those. But if you remove the one, you have a high chance of saving the rest. Secondly, it's meant to make the erring brother feel ashamed. I think we have a big problem with that word ashamed nowadays. We don't want to make anybody feel shame, even if it's for the right reasons. And withdrawing fellowship from an erring member is indeed a right reason. It is a scriptural reason. We are meant to make that individual feel ashamed with the idea that it will bring them back, reconcile them with their God. It also shows the world that the church will not tolerate error that goes unrepented of. It's easy to think that everyone's a pushover if no one stands up. But when people start standing up for what they believe, you know literally where they stand. And in instances like these, we will not engage in error. And those who take a stand are numbered with that. The person in this predicament then crucifies Christ once again and brings him to an open shame. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. says there, It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. I never want these words to be said about me. How terrible of a predicament to be in. You see, when a Christian falls away, it becomes extremely difficult to restore them. Because as our passage read, they were once enlightened by the word. They were convicted by the word. They were made aware of all the promises of God by that word. With all of those things in mind, they still chose to remain in their error. The height of stubbornness. However, it is still our earnest prayer that such erring members have time enough to repent 
and be restored, to have that fellowship regained between them and their God and every faithful member of the Lord's church. Not only do we desire such, but God himself desires such. He desires that all men everywhere will be saved. Thus, he desires to maintain fellowship with his creation. After all, we are, as we stated earlier, made in his image. We all begin life in the flesh in fellowship with our creator. Yet as we grow and develop and we become accountable, we choose to sin. At that point, we have become lost and in need of salvation. That tie of fellowship has been severed. However, God has extended his plan for man's salvation and he has located it in the gospel of Christ. We have discussed this morning what it takes to become a Christian and even what it takes to be restored as a Christian. When one obeys that gospel, follows this plan of salvation, as we stated earlier, this person becomes saved. They are a member of the Lord's church, added by him himself. That person is a Christian, and they have successfully restored fellowship between themselves and their God. Heaven is promised to all those who will faithfully serve him in this life. If you have not been baptized this morning, if you're not a Christian, why not take the necessary steps to be saved this morning? Yet, if you are a Christian and you have allowed sin to return to your life, why not put it away, confess and repent? We'll pray for you. Be restored with a proper relationship between you and your Creator. If you have either of these needs, make it known now as together we stand and sing the haunt.